Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima, Japan, and today I have the pleasure once again of talking with Asby Brown. Thank you so much for joining, Asby. Thanks again for having me, JJ. It's always a pleasure. And you're based in Yokohama, outside Tokyo, right? That's right. I live in a part of Yokohama called Nishia, which is a neighborhood my, my wife grew up in, my mother in law grew up in. It's like a little village in the middle of the city. I've been living here since uh, shortly after we got married 30 years ago. Oh, nice. And uh, you have been on the program before talking about this wastewater release、uh, issue that has been in the news a lot.、Um, but your work as lead researcher of safecast.org. Really puts you in a very interesting position talking to news organizations, training students, and educating、um, how to get more transparent information in real time. And that is kind of, in a nutshell, the work that SafeCast has been doing since the earthquake, tsunami, and power plant disaster in Fukushima area. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right.、Uh, SafeCast began really the day after the disaster on、uh, March 11th, 2011, with conversations with the,、uh, the co founders.、Uh, and that you know, led to people networking and, and building a bigger group. And、uh, by、um, you know, April, we had、uh, started to. Gather our own radiation data,、uh, largely in response to what we thought was the lack of adequate data from the Japanese government. And I think we expected that the core of our project would be, you know, making、uh, radiation detectors that can do mapping, you know, using GPS,、um, things like this. this Di Gaigi, which、uh, we've, we've had, this is a model we've had for the past 10 years,、uh, which we're now.、Uh, Releasing a, a newer version of.、Uh, we thought the hardware and then the online mapping and the database would be the key or the core of our activity. But little by little, we learned that information and education、uh, was at least, if not more important. And my role, I'm one of the only、uh, you know, core members of the group who's not an engineer of some sort. We have electronic engineers, we have software engineers, we have you know, hardware engineers, we have all others. But I'm really an academic、uh, and a writer. So I came in to do research and communication. Uh, so that's、uh, a lot of what I do. And I, I go to conferences overseas and I network with the, the expert community.、Uh, and over the, the decade plus, it's been 12 years, it'll be 13 years next year.、Um, we've developed a really good network of people who understand what we're doing and who are very, very helpful.、Uh, I'm showing the safecast.org news page right here. And it, it links to articles that you've written.、Uh, we'll talk more about your CNN appearance,、uh, your New, New York Times opinion piece. But also,、uh, it shows the training that you do with students and future leaders in order to encourage more transparency in how、uh, data is informed, also, working with local stakeholders, right? Yes, exactly.、Uh, in this case, what we're seeing right now is our、uh, intern. From、uh, earlier this year. He's a United States college student from California、uh, in environmental studies, and he spent time with us.、Uh, we did a field work in Fukushima so he could get a firsthand、uh, glimpse at the situation and sort of understand the reality of, of Fukushima, both the, the positive sides and the negative sides.、Uh, but like I mentioned, the, the education side has been very important for us. And it really began with people who wanted to build、uh, radiation detectors, to build Bigaigis. And when they were like maybe five or Six who wanted to do that, we would have a workshop for them and spend an afternoon or the better part of a day doing that. And that became more and more sort of formalized, where we would、uh, do workshops for, for schools, for high schools in Fukushima or Tokyo or other places,、uh, and even for、uh, elementary school kids for summer programs run by、um, uh, Roppongi Hills, for instance. So、uh, the education is a very important thing. And we also have done kind of Let's say large scale intensive training for experts in Europe under the aegis of UNESCO and the IAEA. So, this is, this is a very important thing. And the key is to help people understand that they can gather this kind of data themselves. They don't have to be dependent on official sources for radiation data or air quality data or almost any kind of information regarding what's happening in the environment, that they can participate to collect and、uh, You know, publish their own data,、uh, and that will you know, increase their trust in the data they have and allow them to compare it with official data and, and hopefully establish some kind of、uh, information based、uh, collaborative relationship with government.
Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just pointing out this picture of the BGAIGI, the radiation detection monitor, yes. uh, which you're training people around the world, including the Ukraine. Yes. And right here, we have a BGAIGI next to a, a gun. Yes. And it really, to me, that's like, which is more powerful, right? Like, which, which defends you better? Sometimes having the right information might be better protection for people. <laughs> Yes, we can talk about it more in a minute, but uh, yeah, after the um, invasion, uh, the Russian military invaded Ukraine, uh, you know, last February, um, February 2022, uh, we were able to reach out to counterparts who have uh, an environmental NGO in Ukraine called Save Nipro, and some of their volunteers are military. What happened in Ukraine, of course, a lot of people entered the military, including people who are environmental scientists and researchers, and we've met a few, and some of them uh, have been able to use our system system, you know, uh, as they go about their daily work. I mean, they're not, uh, you know, we're not publishing data from the front lines or anything like that. But um, but no matter what they're doing, people have a need for alternative sources of information. And, and just because you're in the military doesn't mean you're not also a citizen and have a, a desire to present open data. Yeah. And in this age of misinformation, having uh, people's citizen science ability to see and document their own data and correlate it with what other data is being released from the government, from other sources, is so key, right? Yeah, yeah it's essential. And the key here is participation. And there's so much knowledge and experience at this point. I mean, SafeCast alone has been doing this, like I said, 12 years. Um, there were other organizations even doing things radiation oriented since the Chernobyl disaster. There are great uh, policies in Europe in, in many, many ways to, uh, you know, uh, legally insist that uh, the public be involved, citizens be involved in planning and gathering data. Uh, so it's um, the key is participation. If you want people to trust the data, they have to somehow be involved and have a close look at how how it's collected, how it's presented, and how it should be interpreted. Thanks for that. Uh, just to mention, we did have a comment uh, from Lord Crunk on YouTube. This is a rotten suggestion, but couldn't the contaminated treated water be fracked into very deep layers of the earth below Japan, maybe even under the ocean floor? I believe that was one of the ideas for a while. Um, it, it but, was. Yeah. Before we get into th to that, I'm sure you'll mention some of the alternatives. Uh, can you give us a little update on what's been happening this year with the wastewater? Yes. Uh, the decision was, uh, well, we should, you know, <laughs> rewind a bit back okay. to uh, April 2021 when the decision was made uh, by, by the, the then Prime Minister Suga to, uh, that the water should be released. Uh, and again, this water is uh, water that has been used to help cool the damaged reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, and there's a certain amount that they can they pump through and recirculate. In an ideal system, it would be a closed loop where the only water that comes out is the same quantity they pumped in. But water is leaking into the basements of these reactors through cracks in the foundations, et cetera. So more water needs to be pumped out than they pumped in. So this is this excess cooling water. Uh, and it's gone. It, it's sent through uh, treatment systems, including one called ALPS, uh, Advanced Liquid Processing System, uh, to remove uh, most uh, radioactive material, or it's designed to remove most radioactive material, uh, but it cannot remove uh, tritium, which is a radionuclide uh, that also occurs in nature in quite uh, abundant quantities. Uh, so this excess water has to be stored somehow. So they've been storing it in tanks on site, and now there are about a thousand tanks. It's like 1.3 million uh, tons of water, uh, and uh, it's quite a lot, and it's increasing and increasing. They're running out of space on site. So TEPCO early on said, we, we would like to be able to release this water or do something with it. Uh, as early as 2013, 2014 though, the IAEA was already suggesting they should think about diluting it and releasing it in a controlled fashion. And the reasoning is that if they do that, um, it's, it's preferable to having some kind of catastrophic release. Let's say a terrible earthquake or some other damage burst tanks and suddenly it all flows out like that. They said, let's do this in a controlled way. And it took a while. We thought it was a bit of a kabuki dance because you know, TEPCO obviously wanted to do that, and the Japanese government wanted to do that, but TEPCO was not going to say they were going to do it until the Japanese government told them to do it. And this went on for years, years and years. And and we wrote a report uh, 
as early as 2018, I spent a lot of time talking to people at TEPCO, talking to people in Japanese government, talking to experts, scientists, etc., talking to the, the fisheries cooperatives who have opposed this uh, from the beginning. Uh, and, and even in 2018, well, it was clear that, uh, you know, the, uh, the fisheries opposed it. They would never agree to this uh, because even if they felt it could be safe enough and it wouldn't really, you know, cause harm to eat those fish, uh, that the public would respond as if they were uh, dangerous and would stop buying it. And that's a very, very reasonable assumption based on their experience after Fukushima. Uh, I was also surprised at how unprepared the government was uh, in terms of communication. For instance, I said, I asked the person at METI, uh, the Japanese you know, ministry who's overseeing this, um, what kind of outreach they had done to neighboring countries on the Pacific Rim. And he said, oh, well, nothing yet, but we'll make an English language website. And at this point, I had been involved in many conferences and, and, and processes in Europe, especially uh, in, involved with stakeholder engagement and realized that there are, in Europe, it's, it's, it's regulated, it's required that uh, government involve the public in the decision making from the beginning. Even when they, they, they think they want to do something, then they, they, they have to set up platforms and set up uh, working groups uh, to discuss what should be done. Uh, they have to do environmental assessments, and then the citizens are part of evaluating the environmental assessments, and then the decision is made. And there, this is kind of well known. And, and Japanese uh, you know, agencies and ministry people are also involved in these meetings, so they're very well aware of this. So I was shocked that the Japanese government hadn't thought that that was going to be important. Um, well, then uh, the decision was made in August that the release would begin at the very end of August, and it did. Uh, the IAEA had been uh, asked in 2001 to review the plans for the release in terms of how well they, um, you know, uh, co coordinated or how well they uh, they followed uh, safety guidelines from the IAEA. And they spent two years uh, researching this and studying this and working with Japanese government and working with TEPCO. And ultimately, their final report, which was issued earlier this year, said, yes, it's basically uh, in line with our guidelines and we don't expect there will be any serious impact. So, you know, they spent a lot of time on that. But there's also a lot of things they didn't look at, and we can talk about that more in detail. Uh, but finally, the release happened, and uh, you know there is monitoring done, and the IEA is following the numbers as well. And there are, you know, uh, uh, the JAEA, uh, Japanese Government Radiation Laboratory, is also uh, doing some monitoring, and they hired a company called Kaken, which is in Mito, which has the expertise to do uh, radiation monitoring, and they're also doing monitoring. So there's a lot of information being collected and presented. But ultimately, it doesn't solve the key problems. I don't think any of the information they present actually generates the kind of trust that they were hoping it would generate. So uh, the first releases were happening from the, uh, you know, basically end of August and into September. The second releases happened about a week ago, uh, and uh, monitoring data is showing, again, uh, Kind of not surprisingly that uh, the, the levels of the tritium in the ocean are very, very low. Uh, what they measure for fishes, et cetera, uh, is, is not detected. And I would only add that um, the information we have so far is what they call, you know, rapid measurements which have a high detection limit. So if it's, if it's unless it's above 10 becquerels uh, per, per kilogram or, or something, it's not going to show. But as they do more sensitive um, measurements, which takes more time, I think we will see that there is tritium, there are other radionuclides in the fish and in the water. So this is a bit of a long explanation, but uh, this has been a long process, which we at SafeGas have been following for years. And our main points are not about the safety. The question is not, is it going to be safe enough? It is how will people trust that it's safe uh, based on the lack of, you know, uh, involvement of, of the public in the planning and in the monitoring itself? How can the public have confidence in the official information used to state that all as well? Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, when I went up a few months ago to Fukushima area, and uh, it was kind of a, an analysis of could this area become a tourism appeal point? And I went with you, Asby, and it was such an informative trip mm. around there. There is so much appeal, mm. um, but one of the things we, we had the chance to do was talk to local fisher people yes. and to see how local agriculture, local businesses are very actively testing everything Yes. to be very transparent. So every uh, 
bag of rice had a QR code. Uh, you could check the levels that were tested. You know, they had a citizen kind of testing for individuals who wanted uh, their testing done. Uh, how have the community that we talked to, Asby, how has their response been in, in connection to this issue? Yeah, I mean, as you point out, uh, one of the reasons why um, we at SafeCast, for instance, consider uh, the official data that we see about safety of food, including marine products, fish, is because there's so much independent testing being done. And you mentioned citizen groups. They were at one point like 400 groups doing, you know, radiation monitoring of food, et cetera. Uh, there's quite a few uh, who have been doing it for years, for a decade or more. They have a great deal of expertise. And we think these kinds of groups should have been involved in the planning and the ongoing monitoring of these uh, releases of this, this, this water from Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, there's no reason they shouldn't have been. Uh, but the response is one of great skepticism and annoyance uh, because people know it's not the numbers. It's not just the numbers. It is, you know, uh, are people uh, satisfied in their grievances? Are people uh, satisfied in, um, you know, the, the response from government, uh, how they're being treated uh, and being allowed to, you know, be included in the process is a very, very important part of this. So I'd say most of the best established uh, groups with longest track records are among the most skeptical. And there are groups that are, they're continuing to measure fish and measuring the agricultural produce and there's uh, at least one laboratory, a citizen laboratory in Iwaki, which uh, has begun monitoring uh, seawater. Uh, they're going to be doing that. But it's not the same as being involved from the start in uh, the process along with the government, along with TEPCO. I mean, actually, in the IAEA report, uh, they did four you know, reports over the two years that they were uh, studying the issue and then made a comprehensive report uh, released, I suppose it was May this year, or maybe it was June. Uh, and they pointed out that, you know, uh, it raises questions of conflict of interest if TEPCO is one of the major, uh, you know, organizations involved in the monitoring of this release, that it is a conflict of interest. Uh, you know, they're releasing the water and they're going to be monitoring it. So this, you know, should not be allowed to happen. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of other issues. Um, you know, one big area of complaint was the... Uh, environmental impact assessment. Uh, it's called an REIA, Radioactive Environmental Impact Assessment, a Radiological Environmental Impact Assessment. Uh, the way it should happen and the way it happens in most countries and certainly in Europe uh, is that these sort of studies are done uh, well before the decision is made. Decision is not made until the findings of the studies are in, and in the best cases, which of which there are quite a few, uh, in Scandinavia, in Belgium, in France, uh, the the public, the citizens are involved. Uh, working groups are made that include citizens to go over those findings and say perhaps we should also check this or check that. Uh, we, we you know we should check these animals or check those plants, uh, and then maybe that will be you know more studies will be done, and finally this the decision made. Here, the decision was made in April 2021, and there had been no impact assessment made yet. And this was astounding to me. I was like, "This am I crazy? Is there really no impact assessment? Uh, and it took a long time. And in fact, the IAEA report eventually pointed out that in Japan, it's not legally required. Uh, and that the the government uh, required it, the, the regulator, the NRA, uh, required it in this case kind of as a special case. So, I mean, just to sort of compare to something else we've been discussing, uh, you know, over the past year with the cutting down the trees at Jingu Gaian in this wonderful park in Tokyo where they're cutting down, planning to cut down lots of trees. There was no impact assessment done then either before the decision was made. So this is apparently the way things are done here. And shocking that the public accepts that. Uh, and then this impact assessment that TEPCO did was done. And then many official bodies, expert bodies, ourselves at SafeCast pointed out lots of shortcomings with it. And a lot of what the IAEA's work was, as they spent two years you know, re researching this, was to help TEPCO improve their impact assessment uh, to make this more in line with, you know, uh, global standards and, and even IA standards. So this is a, a long issue and people are very, very frustrated about this.
That's really, that's surprising. I think most people living in Japan and visiting Japan have an experience that Japan takes environmental issues very seriously.、Uh, guests always say, oh, Japan is so clean, so orderly. Everyone's out there cleaning and taking care of the environment is the image, right? So、yeah. when you hear that environmental assessments is not required for these kinds of big issues, that, that is a big surprise. I think the case is that.、Um, You know, in in the case of、uh, building a dam, or we see things in Okinawa regarding you know, expanding US bases, et cetera,、uh, if the prefectural and local governments demand it, I think then it happens. And they certainly have the right to do that. And a lot of the opposition to restarting、um, nuclear power plants, for instance, in, in Japan has come from the prefectural governments.、Uh, but in this case, Uh, Fukushima, certainly the Daiichi area, is in a special administrative category. Parts of it are under the jurisdiction of the uh, in, uh, Minister of the Environment and their other government ministries who really get to decide what happens. So、um, it, it was surprising to me. And we participated, SafeCast participated in, in a number of, I would say, fairly you know, expert level.、Uh, Uh, at the time was the pandemic. So, you know, web, webinars and, and web conferences with experts from Europe and, and elsewhere、uh, where this issue was raised.、Uh, and in fact, the Belgian、uh, laboratory researcher from the Belgian nuclear laboratory,、um, you know, basically they said,、uh, you know, we will do our own, you know, kind of quick assessment. And well, the good news was they said, yes, it looks like based on the information we have, that the impacts will be very low. And the, and the risk and the doses to people will be very low. That's the good news. And the bad news is that we don't have this information that we need.、Uh, so, and again, this decision was made in April 2021, and the impact assessment was not released until November 2021. And again, this is, this is crazy. So, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not just wringing our hands and saying there's nothing can be done because、right. this is an ongoing problem for the next 30 years. Yes, at so least. So, one of your big points, I think, in your op ed for the New York Times was about what could be done from now and、yes. how Japan could make some changes. To really be a world leader for how to handle nuclear waste, which is an international issue, right? It's yeah, not too late. This was a big chance for Japan,、uh, Japanese government, for TEPCO to show the world the best way to handle this issue. And I think, in terms of domestic politics, there really shouldn't have been any reason it couldn't happen to, to create these very inclusive、uh, groups involving citizen in, citizens, involving uh, uh, experts from、uh, around the world, involving、uh, other nations in a, in a more substantial way、uh, to, to make the plans for how to deal with the water,、uh, for monitoring the releases, actually for setting the parameters. What should we look at? What should we be measuring? Where should we be monitoring? To set all that stuff. And then to, to have this continue. And this could be done and should have been done in a way where it's financially supported and independent. It needs to be independent. In this case, it wasn't. And again, in the case of Europe,、uh, there's a few cases that Belgium has some wonderful cases of、uh, you know, establishing uh, 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 nuclear waste depositories where ultimately two towns ended up、uh, competing with each other to have the right to have this nuclear waste site. You know, on their territory. They, they were so confident of, of how safe it would be and, and, and how positive it would be that they wanted it. You know, this can be the case. Japan could have done that, but they've just fumbled it、uh, in terms of the communication side, in terms of the international relations side. They just fumbled it continually. And I think the approach has been,、uh, you know, there were decisions are made. There is this interministerial group that involves the Ministry of Environment,、um, you know, Ministry of uh, you know, uh, 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 Industry, Technology,、uh, the, the Prime Minister's Office, and several others,、uh, but notably, I believe, not the Foreign Ministry. And And these people made the decision. And so, when you know, Japan decision making is very, very difficult, especially with very territorial government ministries you know, who don't want to surrender a shred of their, their, you know,、uh, their, their rights and decision making you know,、uh, power. So, for them to collaborate and come up with a decision, it's going to be really hard to reverse it. So, they made this decision. There are a lot of fallout, international fallout.、Uh, and, and ultimately, it's the ministry of、uh, the foreign ministry who had to like, do the cleanup. And they're doing this incredible diplomatic push both before the decision and afterwards. And I'll point out that、um, I was kind of 
happy that uh, shortly after my op-ed in the New York Times appeared, that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, you know, spokesperson uh, sent in a, a response. They responded to it. Um, that was, to me, a good sign uh, that they were taking it seriously. And they actually said that um, I was unfair. <laughs> being too critical. Uh, and they pointed out things like, oh, we had more than 1,500 meetings. Well, that's great to have meetings, but these are all one way, what we call decide, announce, defend. Like, this is the decision, <laughs> you know, uh, and this is why it's going to be fine. And uh, basically, they weren't these kind of, this process of setting up working groups with citizens and researchers to like decide what to do. It was one way, one way, one way. So, um, Anyway, I was happy that they responded. It was, for me, a good sign. And uh, a lot of their concern, of course, has been the Chinese response. And uh, the Chinese responded with a massive disinformation push, the most preposterous disinformation. And, you know, don't get me wrong. We, we are targeting our criticism of TEPCO and the Japanese government in, in, in the issues of transparency and inclusion uh, about the decision making, but you know, we say there's not quite enough information to know totally about the safety. But basically, from these guidelines, we can we can make this judgment that it will probably be okay. The fish will be okay. I will eat the fish. I have no concerns about that. The Chinese basically presented it to their people as the Japanese uh, are killing you. They're killing the Chinese, uh, and doing it in a way. See, the Chinese uh, people do not have access to a lot of the information that we do over overseas. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a very coordinated uh, disinformation push, uh, pretty much centrally directed clearly. And the, the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan asked me to write about that, which I did, because, you know, uh, it was the, the worst kind of thing. It seems to have quieted down a bit. Um, and unfortunately, I would say Japanese government sort of set themselves up for this. They basically handed the Chinese and anybody else this, this stick, this cudgel, that they could use to like beat Japan over the head with by not really uh, following the best practices, including international outreach. And early on, you know, people I spoke with, including diplomats said, uh, do you really think the Chinese government would be prepared to play a positive role here? And we'd say, you know, very possibly not. But you know, in fact, they should have been consulted early on as the countries of the Pacific, as the South Korean government, they should have been uh, consulted and included early on instead of rather, you know, uh, being subject to this diplomatic outreach after the uh, decision was made. Thanks for that, those insights and for the FCC uh, J report about the, the Chinese misinformation about the, this is such a big international issue. And yeah. the last thing we need is, is more misinformation or propaganda, but you can see how it's an opportunity to rile up anti-Japanese sentiment as well. Yes, and, and you know, Again, like you're pointing out, we're in this disinformation sphere. Uh, we see this happening now, uh, the war, Israel and Gaza. We've seen this happening uh, about the where the, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we see it with electoral politics in the U.S. We see this everywhere. It's very hard to wade through the disinformation and to establish uh you know, what is or what is not a trustworthy source of information. And this is why it's even more incumbent on governments. And, you know, Japan should set an example for this, you know, how to do this in the best possible way uh, so that in the future, other countries, and maybe it would be China, who's releasing a lot of tritiated water in more than Japan is, uh, you know, and, and if they want to do a more dangerous release, well, then they could say, well, the Japanese sort of did it unilaterally, so can we. Russia has a very, very bad record of, of uh, having uh, releases of, you know, nuclear waste, uh, certainly into the ocean, into the atmosphere, uh, and, and, and covering it up, saying, no, we didn't do anything. Uh, they have a terrible history. So we need to set uh, standards and expectations uh, for the global community based on the rule of law, because all of these things are covered by international agreements. Uh, the law of the sea, uh, again, uh, IEA guidelines, official guidelines regarding nuclear waste. So um, they need to, they should have done this in, in the best possible way, but instead we sort of see this sort of chaotic stumbling into a decision, making a decision, waiting too long to make the decision, and doing it in a way that implies that they don't really need to consult with anybody about it, which I think was, you know, a big mistake. Uh, 
and because they were already suffering, both the Japanese government and TEPCO suffering from this massive uh, deficit of trust. Now we've had a few comments about uh, how the water could be released maybe better. Uh, one idea is putting it deep into the ocean. I know that was considered for a while or deep underground. Uh, let's have a look at uh, some of the pictures that you've sent where it shows sure. the diagram for how yeah. it's being released. Yeah, so I mean, to go back to the background, the, they, the government established uh, working groups uh, to study this issue. Uh, back as early, again, 2014, 2015, and it's interesting because they sort of changed the name of these things over time, uh, the Contaminated Water Countermeasures Working Group, and then it was the Treated Water <laughs> Countermeasures Working Group, uh, and then it's the Alps Treated Water. <laughs> they keep, it's sort of this, this uh, Orwellian, you know, redefinition of the problem. But uh, in 2016, one of these large working groups, their report, they evaluated basically six options. And one of them was deep, you know, underground injection. Now, this is kind of a non-starter. It's going to be too expensive. It, it wasn't really uh, plausible. Uh, others were, uh, you know, making a big pit and dumping in a big pit and then covering it up. And uh, others were, you know, dilution and release, which is what is actually happening now. There was another one, evaporation, evaporated into the atmosphere. Uh, and um, uh, another is to, to do a chemical cracking to split the tritium, the hydrogen and oxygen, uh, you know, so they could be separately sequestered. But, um, it was clear that really they wanted to do the dilution and release or maybe evaporation. And they, they said, you know, in terms of, it was a very technocratic approach. They're not thinking of social issues or public response or any of that, just basic cost, uh, technical feasibility based on what we know can be done now. Uh, you know, what have other countries done? And they said dilution and re release would be one of the better options. Um, this map that you're showing is actually from the IAEA uh, uh, final report, the comprehensive report, which I want to point out clarified a lot of things. Their information infographics were better and clearer and easier to understand than anything TEPCO had presented until then. Uh, their explanation of the regulatory process, things like I mentioned, the fact that there was no requirement for an environmental study, they clarified much more of who is responsible for what. But basically, there's a big pipe. It's big enough for people to, to, to stand up and then walk through that goes from this dilution uh, and testing facility onshore at Fukushima Daiichi, one kilometer out into the ocean, and then it's released at that point. So, um, you know, it's a big infrastructure, but in terms of like environmental impact, uh, you know, that area of the ocean offshore of Fukushima Daiichi has some of the most radioactive contamination on the seabed, where things have fallen down to the seabed and over the years it's get covered up by new silt and stuff but if you're going to be digging in that and poking holes in it you're going to release a lot of radioactive material they should have had you know an impact study of that alone but they didn't uh but it's being released um you know in groups uh you know pretty much it looks like almost monthly the first one i mentioned was it ended in september the second one ended in october so perhaps monthly and they're seeing if the system's working the way they think it will it should they pump the water from the tanks it's been treated by Alps. And this is the other major point, uh, JJ, is uh, TEPCO and Japanese government insisted that that system, this Alps system, would remove all the radionuclides except tritium. But in fact, that was not true. Uh, and in 2018, this is after I wrote my big report, it was revealed that in fact there is strontium, ruthenium, uh, technetium, and a lot of other radionuclides that we should be concerned about in very, very high concentrations. And TEFCO said, oh yes, well, you know, the system really wasn't working well, or we were just trying to, you know, minimize doses. We didn't care that it wasn't working well, but 70% of that water has a lot of radionuclides besides tritium. And this has been downplayed consistently by the government and TEPCO. So the people who criticize it, and we're showing now a graph by a, a researcher I know very well from Woods Hole named Ken Bissler, who, who researched this. And he and his colleagues said, you should give us access to these tanks to take samples and analyze what's actually in the tanks. Because there is no clear um, analysis. There's no full inventory of what's in all of those tanks yet. And the IEA basically gave uh, TEPCO a pass. TEPCO said, we don't really need to know what's in the tanks as long as when we measure it before we release it, everything's low enough. Well, you know, that's very optimistic. That's incredibly optimistic. And it's surprising that the IEA would, would let them, you know, do it that way.
And the IEA had a lot of other criticism about how they're calculating and determining what's in the water. Uh, actually told said repeatedly that TEPCO should have their, their analysis method peer reviewed, which is like saying, this is hinky science, you know, uh, but they let them go with it. So, um, yeah. So anyway, this it, the, the, the water's moved from the tanks. Uh, it's measured. It will have like a million becquerels of tritium in it. Uh, and then they dilute it like 800 times with seawater that's being pumped in into another tank. And then they measure it. Uh, and, and in the two sets of releases that we've had so far, the levels of tritium have been under 200 becquerels uh, per liter, which is, uh, well, you know, some people say that's not low enough, but it's uh, far below the... Um, you know, the the Japanese regulatory limit is six sixty thousand becquerels per liter, so it's far below that. The World Health Organization's limit is ten thousand becquerels per liter. It's well below that, and the Japanese, you know, TEPCO and the Japan government had committed to uh, that it would be less than one thousand five hundred. So they're hitting that target, but again. Uh, you know, people would be justified to to still be skeptical uh, if that will continue without uh, problems for the next, you know, 30 years. And if in fact that is a safe level, like shouldn't we s stop dumping stuff in the ocean? You know, I mean, that's really is, is a point of view. And in terms of the safety, just last week, a few days ago, there's a news report of some workers, uh, you know, doing some cleaning uh, on this ALP system and a hose came loose and they got sprayed with radioactive material. Uh, two of them uh, needed to go to the hospital, not that they were injured, but because they needed to be tested thoroughly. Hopefully th there's no serious issue, but this is the kind of stuff that happens. Uh, and we're thinking, you know, it's going to go for 30 years with no major mishap. That's again, very, very optimistic. That was one of the the key points I thought in your New York Times article, uh, talking about the history of kind of hiding information, yeah. not being as clear as they could uh, in the whole TEPCO uh, disaster after yeah. 2011. They were minimizing risk. They were withholding information. Yes. Um, didn't use the word core meltdown, even though that's yes. what clearly what was happening um, in 2018. Like you said, 70% of the tanks mm. contained higher than legal limits of the radioactive material. Um, these kinds of things haven't been very transparent. So that's one of the key issues, the key features of your work with SafeCast is to create this idea that we need more transparency. Right. We need more stakeholder engagement, right? Yeah, people should be, it should be inclusive. People should be involved. Uh, and I want to point out uh, what we are doing primarily at SafeCast, the kind of measurement we do is, is ambient radiation, uh, you know, which you can use a, a normal radiation detector. And again, we've developed uh, our own, and this is a, a newer, our newest model is called the Bigaigi uh, Zen. It's a simpler, simpler to build, et cetera. Uh, people can, can measure this easily, but measuring radiation in water is hard. Uh, you need a very well-equipped professional laboratory. Uh, and I mentioned there is at least one citizen group in, in Iwaki called Tarachine who does have that capability. It's not easy. It's not like we can just go and measure it and, and know for sure what's in the water. You need very sensitive equipment. So, But uh, people should be involved in that process, in, in the collection, in the, you know, checking the results, in the correlation. And there are uh, good examples. Again, I mentioned Europe. In France, for instance, which has uh, nuclear facilities in uh, La Hague that have been dumping, uh, again, tritiated water uh, into the English Channel for decades. Uh, and a lot of what we know about the, the behavior of tritium uh, in the ocean and after releases comes from uh, French research. The, the National Laboratory IRSN has done really some of the leading research on this. And citizen groups are included. Uh, in this process, and some of which do have very good measurement capability. They're included as a matter of course, which is one reason why we can be as confident as we can be about the findings. And again, it it's baffles me that the Japanese government and TEPCO were not encouraging this. They should be encouraging, you know, this development of, of the capability of their society uh, to participate, to be more fully democratic uh, in this way. 
Yeah. I think that uh, ties in nicely with uh, in previous talks on your work with SafeCast. We've talked about how you are uh, training and getting these same guygos, guygi counters, into the Ukraine. And yes. you recently this year you went there yes. and worked with some of your local collaborators. Can you want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, of course, you know. The Chernobyl, uh, the nuclear power plant, is is in Ukraine, and of course that was a site of massive, uh, you know, nuclear disaster in 1986. And there has been lots of research uh, there, researchers there. It's become kind of a, you know, an important place for learning about how uh, radiation uh, behaves in the environment afterwards. Uh, we've had contacts with researchers who've uh, used our systems there in, in in past years. We have data from Chernobyl. Uh, researchers, tourists, also, um, you know, a journalist. Uh, and when the invasion uh, of Ukraine happened in late February uh, last year, uh, perhaps the, you know our listeners will remember uh, the the Russian army invaded through Chernobyl. Uh, one wing, one one uh, thrust was through Chernobyl, and radiation detectors in the Chernobyl uh, exclusion zone, many of them showed this high spike of radiation, and then went offline. And the data became unavailable. And this was very puzzling and concerning. And then the Russians are occupying the zone so nobody can get in there to check. Uh, and eventually, uh, in, in the very end of March, beginning of April, the Russians pulled out and, and access was restored. Uh, and we, by that point, you know, we have, were able to have, uh, you know, people from our network go in and measure uh, some of the first uh, measurements of Chernobyl after uh, the invasion were done by SafeCast volunteers. Um, but we reached out to uh, this person <laughs> in this photo. Uh, uh, his name is Pavlo Kachenko, and uh, he's Ukrainian. Uh, he is the co-founder of an NGO called Save Nipro. And his hometown, he lives in the town of Nipro. It's a big city, actually, a million people, uh, which is in southeastern Ukraine, not far from the front lines. And they began their project uh, by uh, developing a system called Save Ecobot, which people could use to, uh, you know, uh, make uh, complaints about pollution. And it was brilliant. Uh, they made this online system where people could could uh, just enter information and then it would automatically fill out the official PDF forms that the government agencies required. It would send them to the government. Brilliant. And then they started aggregating air quality monitoring data from different sources, uh, public sources mainly. And then a year before the invasion, they, they realized there was a lot of radiation information as well available that they could aggregate. Uh, and they put that on their map, a very useful map. Well, lo and behold, after the invasion uh, last year, they were the only ones who had the data of what was happening in Chernobyl. The government systems were offline, but they had the data. And uh, I was able to get in touch with them, and we started talking, and then ultimately began a collaboration called Be Geiges for Ukraine. And basically, you know, prior to this, we had had a lot of outreach and collaboration with uh, researchers at various laboratories in Europe, and I asked uh, the people at the Czech National Laboratory called SURO, S-U-R-O, if they would be willing to lend some Be Geiges uh, to uh, Save Nipro to use in Ukraine, and they immediately said yes. And the um, lab director actually hand-carried 10 B Geiges from Prague to Berlin on the train, handed them off to uh, an, uh, a humanitarian group to bring them uh, to uh, Ukraine, where they handed them off to uh, Pavlo Kachenko, who then distributed them to researchers and people in his network. So that that project has been going since, uh, you know, basically I would say May uh, of or May or June of of 2022. We kept it quiet for a while and then finally went public with it. And is continuing to collect information. The next step, though, what's really necessary is to establish an independent network of real-time radiation monitoring systems. In other words, the B-Geige, um, you know, you, you walk around with it or you put it in your car and it makes a map, uh, you know, of, of, of radiation. But we have other systems and we've been developing a series of these over the years. And uh, we now have one called RadNote, which is uh, being developed for us by a company called Blues Wireless, whose CEO is one of our chief advisors. His name is Ray Ozzie, a brilliant man and very, very helpful person. Uh, and this is wireless. And it has something called the note card, which is a wireless uh, 
data data card that will work in over 100 countries and uh, basically this uh, you just turn it on and it will find the network and start sending data and should work for five to ten years so we now have been testing this for about a year and we are about to deploy uh for the beginning, about 40 and eventually uh, maybe as many as 100 real-time radiation sensors across Ukraine. And we're going to focus on uh, nuclear uh, sites. For instance, well, Chernobyl, although we don't expect any huge risk there, there's the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which, again, listeners will remember, uh, was also invaded and taken over by the Russian military uh, early last year. And they um, have turned it into a military base and basically continue to threaten uh, that there will be some kind of nuclear accident there. And, uh, you know, Russian, basically their behavior there has been uh, uh, astoundingly uh, uh, careless and uh, uh, violating every international agreement about uh, safety of nuclear power plants. And uh, basically the IEA also has people there on site full time, but, you know, they can't do anything. People think the IA will, will save them, but basically they have to get permission just to go walk around and look at things. They're asking for months to be allowed to look at the roofs of certain buildings, and they're not allowed to do it. So it's very important to have, uh, we think, independent detectors uh, to supplement the official system, because if something bad happens, let's say that even if it's an accident, let's say it's not a Russian missile, you know, uh, you know, aimed at the power plant, uh, even if it's just an accident, uh, people will want to know the official system may be hacked, it may go off the line, like what we saw in Chernobyl, uh, it's important to have an independent system. So we are in the stages of, of, of setting that up. And my uh, trip to Ukraine, I was there for about a week, uh, uh, a month ago, back in September. Um, you know, that was to meet with our counterparts for the first time. I mean, I'm talking with them every day online, basically. It was finally to meet face to face, uh, to spend time. We, we've centered in Kiev uh, because, you know, that's where, uh, you know, people from their, their team are there. Uh, we had meetings with their team. We went to Chernobyl. This is us in Chernobyl with a researcher uh, named Andrew Simon, who was very, very helpful working with us to collect data in Chernobyl. We met with other researchers who uh, basically are ecologists and, you know, environmentalists who were researching there, and we talked about how to uh, develop the system, how to deploy it, uh, what kind of timing we'll need, uh, and how to actually train people there in Ukraine uh, about these systems, uh, about how to install them, so that you know, you know, they can then go to their communities uh, and do this. So we're looking forward to this. It's an important initiative for us, uh, and we're putting a lot of uh, effort into it. And again, it's all made possible because um, of uh, the Blue's Wireless Company, who uh, agreed to you know develop this this radiation sensor and make them available. You know, they are basically supporting us, supporting Safecast in this in this venture. That's so wonderful to hear. And I would I would echo what Gregory has said, what good news from within a horrible situation. I think some of the things that you've said is about the Ukraine situation it has so many parallels um, to your work in the Fukushima area. It's hard for the public to know what or who to trust mm. in these times and having more information um, from a variety of sources like with the Big Aigis, it really helps to have peace of mind and to kind of be able to correlate and research with citizen science, right? Yes, yes it is. And you know, it's surprising because, um, and I talk with you know Pavlo again almost every day, and and he says you know he'll be get, doing talks or talking to people and I'll say you know why should we be collecting radiation data when there's no accident happening, and people often just don't understand why it's important just to establish a baseline of data, especially independent data about this sort of thing, and to be prepared before the accident happens. If we had been prepared before the Fukushima disaster, there would have been a lot less panic, we think. People would have been, you know, a, a lot more secure in their decision making. And and again, having this data, uh, this trustworthy data, especially if you've collected it yourself or people you trust have collected it, uh, enables you to make better informed decisions uh, and certainly lowers the panic factor, uh, lowers the stress factor. So, um, you know, it is important to do this. Uh, and again, Ukraine is in the middle of a war and that makes everything 10 times more difficult. Uh, and we also have, you know, uh, you know, we, we basically do not 
collaborate with government per se. We avoid that because you know independence is very important. But you cannot but try to need need to accommodate, understand what the regulations are, understand where what your activity may be doing may be colliding with government initiatives, especially in a situation like the war. So we're trying to keep people informed, uh, trying to you know uh, you know do outreach to uh, official laboratories and official ministries as well, so that they know what they're doing. And again, uh, Save Nipro is doing a lot of that there. Uh, they have, you know, sometimes one ministry of one uh, oblast, which is like a prefecture, will say, oh, yes, your maps are so good. Can you make our maps? Uh, and then they'll say, great, we should, you know, do them for the rest of the country. And then someone else higher up says, no, no, you can't do that. So there's a, a lack of understanding of why it's important, of why this kind of public independent information is important. And a lot of this is, you know, this ongoing uh, a public effort to uh, inform people and help them understand uh, both that they have the right to do this uh, and that it's necessary and helpful. I think that's so true. And that brings back to the issues in Japan and anywhere around the world. Uh, this goal that SafeCast has to have robust, resilient, independent, and publicly available in real time information about what's yes. going on, right? Yeah, this is it. And, and the, it has to be uh, trustworthy. Uh, and it has to be responsible, it has to be transparent, it has to be nationally and internationally supported uh, and the key is, you know, it's about human health, right? And it's about the the environment. This is a, the ocean. It's the marine ecosystem, or it could be the the terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, and it needs to be done in a way that will help people, you know, it, it be more confident to build public confidence rather than just feed into their doubts and their anti-government, you know, suspicion and stuff. And it needs to be able to counter disinformation, including this politically motivated disinformation that we that we see that happens so easily. Uh, it's a big ticket. It's a big ticket, but we think it's doable. And, uh, you know, as, as, you know, different communities in different parts of the world, um, either, uh, for instance, they participate in our project or they start similar projects of their own. As this happens, it becomes more common and more expected. Uh, people understand that the science is good. The data is good. It's useful. Uh, and that they own it. You know, it's 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 something they're a part of, and and they can be proud of, and they can use this to uh, to support their conversations and their arguments and their negotiations with government and else other people. Yeah, it's really important, and to keep the discussion going, and to include all the stakeholders in yeah. data analysis and uh, development planning. It's yeah. it's all part yeah. of an important process. Yeah, and you know we we often have uh, you know meetings and conversations with uh, first responders, for instance, in the U.S. or in Europe, or even recently in Ukraine, and you know we we point out from the from the very beginning that we know that they have the greatest responsibility and they're responsible to actually put themselves at risk, physically at risk, if there is an accident or something, uh, that they go to the, the hottest areas, uh, the riskiest areas, and they gather the data there. And we know that. And and that's, we we have a much uh, better position. Uh, we, we, we don't need to take that risk, but we point out to them, and, and most of them understand this, that uh, people are going to need information. They are going to want to know information from a distance, you know, 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 500 kilometers. People in other countries will want to know. And, 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 and this will, you know, uh, this is something that the emergency responders and official agencies rarely have the manpower and reach to actually address that in an adequate way. So we're saying, you know, we're on the same team. You know, we, we don't have to be adversaries. We're on the same team. We want the same things. We respect what you're doing. We want your feedback because these are often very, very competent experts and have, uh, you know, good points to make to improve our system. Uh, we want their feedback. We welcome their participation. Uh, but we also know that when the shit comes down, they will be in the hot spot and we will be comfortably at a distance, uh, you know, monitoring and trying to provide, provide information for the rest. So it's uh, it this relationships with the official agencies and government is always going to be tricky uh, because a lot of them don't trust so-called activists and they look at us as activists, you know, and they don't trust that we don't have some political motivation, you know, or not trying to top all the government or anything. It's hard for them to really understand that. But the more that uh, individually these researchers and first responders spend time with us, uh, the more open they become and most of them end up participating in our project. 
Well, it's all about building trust, which is so important in Japan and anywhere, really. Um, but your, I think your main point, which is really important to, to reiterate, is that it's not too late. Things are not completely over. This is going to be a very long issue over the next 30 years. And it is a chance in a positive way for Japan to reposition and start applying some more positive models maybe in place around the world. Is that right? I definitely think so. Uh, it's never too late to start a more inclusive, let's say, monitoring body uh, that that has the composition that I mentioned with you know citizens and independent researchers and uh, others, so academics or, or whoever. Um, it's never too late, but um, we also know that it's impossible to add transparency after the fact. It needs to be built in from the beginning. And this is something that we really took to heart when we began SafeCast. Everything we're going to do is going to be open from the beginning. And it is, the data is open, our designs are open, all of it is open. No one needs permission to see how our system works, to get the data, to analyze it, to check it. Uh, and it's hard for organizations and governments who are, let's say by nature, allergic to transparency. Uh, it's hard for them to one, uh, understand or grasp or accept how much more transparent and open they really need to be and then to take those steps. They're just sort of, the knee-jerk reaction is to close things up. And we see this uh, in almost every country uh, and not just Japan, but we think it can be done. Uh, at the same time, in the case of Japan, we get the feeling that the government and TEPCO really wants everyone to sort of forget about this. They're hoping it recedes from consciousness uh, and in a way sort of providing a deluge of detailed information, uh, you know, sort of swamp people with numbers is one way to make them sick of it. And, uh, and basically they'll say, ah, who cares, you know? And I think they're counting on this. Uh, I think they were counting on this years ago, uh, you know, before this news was released in 2018 that these tanks at Fukushima Daiichi had so many other dangerous radionuclides in them. They were thinking, ah, oh, it's quieted down. We can make this decision soon and nobody's gonna care. Boom, you know, uh, it's not the case. So uh, I kind of feel for them on an individual basis. I've had, you know, good conversations with people that I can trust on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but you get them functioning in an organization and, and they can rarely contradict their boss. They can rarely reverse a decision. Uh, there's no upside for anybody in the Japanese ministry to say, you know, that was a bad decision. Let's, <laughs> let's do something else. You know, that's a career killer. So, you know, we should expect more from them, I suppose, but in fact, this is also human nature. And and as we see, uh, some of the, sometimes conflicts and these disasters, they bring out the best in people, but they also bring out the worst. What would SafeCast advise? Like, what could they put into place in the next few years, which would make it more inclusive for the community, more transparent? Is there anything that you can think of that they could start implementing in the next few years? Yes, they, they could announce and establish an independent oversight board, a, a, a fully independent oversight board. Uh, there are examples of, uh, you know, let's say, you know, energy industry uh, funds to fund research, for instance. Uh, uh, they could do something like that to pool funds, independent funds, uh, have it independently directed and managed, uh, but funded from the outside uh, also, uh, you know, foundations would be happy to to help support this sort of thing. Uh, to have a board with a an adequate, uh, adequately inclusive composition, and again, that needs to include uh, citizen representatives, citizen groups, environmental groups, uh, research uh, laboratories, researchers uh, from around the world, independent if they're qualified. Uh, you know, include them. Uh, include education and training, so you will have students coming in as interns, as workshops, to do public outreach, to do public training and information. Uh, how do you monitor? How do you measure? How do these labs work to inform people of this? But it needs to be independent. It can't be seen to be working hand in hand with either government or the energy industry, uh, certainly not TEPCO. And this needs to be funded for the long term. And in the cases I mentioned in my op-ed, uh, for instance, in Belgium, that's how it was done. Uh, and it's it's they've been ongoing for over a decade uh, and will continue. And this long-term funding is essential. 
Uh, and again, you know, they need to be open. They'll have open hearings. Sometimes there is a concern that they become a bit, you know, sclerotic and that, you know, they become institutionalized themselves. But in, in fact, if the process is done uh, well, that, that need not be uh, a problem. And I think it's possible to do that. The key though, and, and JJ, this is something that um, I, I, you cannot stress enough, is that these kinds of organizations, the citizens have to have the right to say no. And in the case of Belgium, with these nuclear waste sites and the town is called Dessau, uh, they were given the right to say no. From the beginning, if you say no, we will not do this. Uh, and that has to be the case. That is probably politically so revolutionary in Japan, I think there would be such outcry from government against it. Uh, it's a really, really tough sell, but the citizens have to have the right to say no. Uh, and without that, then there are no teeth. Well, that's a great final point to leave it on. Uh, an aim for sure uh, for the government organizations moving forward. Thank you, Asby, for all the wonderful and important work that you're doing, not only in Japan, but also in the Ukraine uh, with safecast.org. I would encourage everyone watching to go and visit the website to see the latest uh, news there on the website, often written by Asby himself. Thank you so much for giving up your time and sharing some of your insights. It's a very confusing issue, uh, and I think you've helped us understand it a bit better. So thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. I always enjoy talking with you, uh, you know, either here online or riding on a bus through Fukushima. So <laughs> I think it's, it's great, and I look forward to talking to you again. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, for joining today as well. Uh, wonderful comments and questions along the way. And of course, as always, if you have any other comments or questions, please leave them below and either I or Asby will make sure and reply. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you.